Hey friends, just a couple of disclaimers before we hop into this video. Number one, HP Lovecraft was a, to put it generously, uh, a very controversial man, even at the time which he was alive, which... That's f***ed up. So note that if watching this video makes you curious about HP Lovecraft um, and you've not looked into his stuff yet, uh, just understand that it is certainly a product of the time. Disclaimer number two, spoilers for these games. All right, let's go. As a big fan of cosmic horror, I often find myself at a loss for words when I think about the officially licensed Call of Cthulhu brand video games that seem to struggle to convey the themes of Lovecraft properly through their gameplay, despite there being so many great examples of games with Lovecraftian storytelling, somehow the officially licensed games seem to miss the mark. We're going to start off by looking at two officially licensed Call of Cthulhu brand games. The first one being Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. And the second one being Call of Cthulhu. By the way, brace yourself, you are going to hear the words Call of Cthulhu so much in this video, so, you know, buckle your ass. Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth is a game that was made in the year 2005, the year that these classics came out. Holy shit! So, you know, everybody played this game. With a rating of 6 out of 10 on Steam, 4.1 out of 5 on Good Old Games, and 8.4 out of 10 on IMDB, the greatest place on the internet to get your video game reviews, <laughs> the ratings of this game are solid. Like, from average to pretty freaking good. So what's the problem? Here is the issue with this game. Apart from the fact that, for the most part, it, it doesn't work. It crashes a lot. <laughs> The first section of the game is solid. It is essentially a playable version of Lovecraft's story, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, where you play as Jack Walters, a private detective who, after investigating a decrepit manor that a cult inhabited for a time, he gets sucked into a strange, ever-deepening rabbit hole of terror when his investigations lead him through Innsmouth. This is good. But then it turns into an action-adventure first-person shooter with a dash of cosmic horror in which you play as John Cthulhu, Slayer of Monsters. You end up fighting plenty of deep ones, flying polyps, a Shoggoth, and even Father Dagon himself. What happened? This is not a review of the game. This is not a review of the game. Although it is certainly not the best game, I would not recommend buying it because as previously stated, it doesn't work and doesn't capture the themes well. This is a rumination on why this doesn't work for creating a Lovecraftian atmosphere. Feeling like you have power over the horrors from beyond is never something you should experience if you are in a Lovecraftian story. If by some means you do manage to overcome the things from beyond, the vast majority of the time, you will lose everything. Now, to be fair, our boy Jack Walters does end his own life at the end of the game. But this is only after having made contact with the great race of Yith, and from which he is informed that his family lineage is partially Yithian. But with everything else he has faced in this game up until that point, he would have lost his sanity a long time ago. If that revelation about his family lineage was enough to break him, I have seen the depths of the universe and all of a sudden my dad is alien. Oh no! Also, with the AI being, uh, not the smartest, you don't get the feeling you are dealing with something that is to be feared. It is the perfect example of dissonance of what power you the player are granted and what power the story is telling you that you have with this example of Dark Corners of the Earth being that you literally fight Dagon and survive. I don't believe Dagon dies, but you win. But the story and the Lovecraftian experience demand that you lose, despite the fact that you have won. It doesn't work. 
This brings us to, more recently, Call of Cthulhu. I remember when they were advertising this game and they released a bunch of developer interviews in which they talked about how the game works. They, uh, they kind of took down all those interviews because I can't find them f***ing anywhere. They mention that they took mechanics from the Call of Cthulhu tabletop RPG, which is a game I love dearly. My shelves are empty right now because I am moving, but look at all them Cthulhu books. So as a fan of the Call of Cthulhu tabletop RPG, I really wanted to play this game. So I bought it, and I was unfortunately disappointed with the end product. DISAPPOINTED! Some mechanics from the game were present. These included a small amount of skills from the TTRPG, which to be fair, there's no way they could have fit all of these skills into a video game, as well as some form of a sanity system. Although after playing the game and watching a playthrough, I still don't quite understand how it works. I don't think it's the same as the one in the TTRPG. If it is, it's very like poorly explained, but the mechanics surrounding your character's sanity essentially can be explained like this. You see something messed up, it messes with your mental health. That changes the choices of what ending you get. In terms of how it is tracked, however, I, I don't really understand. With the way the skill system is handled being a TTRPG percentile dice system in a video game, the designers made the unfortunate mistake of locking very important information behind dice rolls that a Keeper of Arcane Lore or a Game Master of the Tabletop RPG would likely just give to you. Or in the circumstance that you fumbled the dice roll so horribly, perhaps they would give you a new trail to follow in order to get to the same conclusion. Tabletop RPGs only work because tabletop RPGs are flexible. Video games are not so flexible. So unfortunately, the tabletop RPG mechanics were not well adapted for the video game medium. But that's not even what we're talking about. Why does this game fail to deliver the Cthulhu experience? This game is an extremely on the rails walking simulator with some stealth sections and a very short section of shooting where the game plays itself with auto lock on mechanics. You don't really have much in the way of agency as the player. The puzzles of the game usually have multiple solutions, but in terms of the story progression and the gameplay, it's all noticeably extremely on the rails. I understand that that is the point of the story, with everything being preordained, but with very little in the way of worthwhile decision making throughout the game, I never felt like I was really in the story as a player. I felt like I was watching a movie instead of playing a game, but then I would suddenly be reminded that I was playing a game when one of the stealth sections came up, and then it was once again back to the movie. Call of Cthulhu fails to capture Lovecraftian themes through its gameplay because there was very little gameplay, and the few mechanics that are present in the game don't have much of an impact on the player experience if at all. They just have minor changes on how the movie plays out, and on top of that, they're shallow, offering little variance to gameplay, further lessening the agency that you have as a player, leaving you with no agency to strip away as the game progresses. Ideally, a Lovecraftian game makes you feel like you have agency, then destroys most if not all of the control you felt like you had because your efforts couldn't possibly make a difference. Or could they? If that is not something that you are thinking about whilst you are playing a Lovecraftian game, the game has failed. Call of Cthulhu never gave you control as a player. On top of that, the AI is dumb and will lose track of you the moment you leave their vision. <laughs> like dark corners of the earth, Call of Cthulhu's enemies don't feel scary to go against. They're just a bunch of goobers. <laughs> On top of that, the voice direction is hit or miss. The actor does a fine job with what they were given, but the director is very hit or miss. When the director hits the mark, Edward Pierce, your character has some really good authentic reactions to stuff. Then at other times, he either ignores things that would be important, or he is John Cthulhu and is severely underwhelmed by the situation. So to sum it all up, the main character has the appropriate power level to be a Lovecraftian games protagonist, but unfortunately this game is a movie. The enemies are a bunch of buffoons and the voice direction gives mixed signals on the importance and severity of situations, making this game unfortunately in the end to be just a bit of a mess. Are you prepared to answer the easiest question in the world? How does one make a lengthy game 
within a style of storytelling that was traditionally written in short stories, where the player feels like they have power and agency, but they can't completely win, in which the characters look into Lovecraftian horrors that make them lose their sanity, but the change with their sanities has to be noticeable in some way, that feels interactive enough that the player feels like they have agency in a style of storytelling that does everything in its power to remove the feeling of control and existential importance, with the understanding that the game has to make sense and be an enjoyable enough experience for people to want to play it through to the end to get the resolution of the story, which will quite likely not be a traditionally satisfying ending and will require some extra work in-game and perhaps even out of game to find the real satisfaction within the bleak and sudden finality of the story. Okay, it's not the easiest question in the world. In fact, it kind of hurts my head, but it is the question you have to answer if you are going to be making a Lovecraftian game. Now we're going to talk about two games that perfectly capture Lovecraftian theming. The first one we're going to talk about, however, is not a lengthy game. Before I dive into this game, I was going to make this video a while ago, but then the Titan submarine incident happened and a bunch of people bought Iron Lung, and this whole deep sea horror thing really felt like a trend that I was uncomfortable hopping onto at the time. So I didn't make this video at the time. I had quite literally just finished the recording for this video of all the games that I'm talking about, and then it happened. So I felt a little bit gross talking about this topic while the internet was, well, being the internet. So I made my bolt gun video instead. Hope you enjoyed that one. Anyways, Iron Lung was one hell of an experience. A truly terrifying examination of deep sea exploration. A firm reminder of the fact that while the endless ocean of space above us recently had news of the idea that we are quite likely not the biggest fish swimming within it, there is still an unknowable, uninhabitable, and uncaring sea just off of our shores. Iron Lung, a game that took me about 1 hour and 20 minutes to beat 100% and be done with, has not left my brain since I have played it. I have been thinking about it non-stop when I have not been playing Baldur's Gate 3. <gasps> Especially the brief bit of lore the game gives you, putting humanity in one of the most desperate positions I have ever seen in fiction. With almost all of humanity suddenly disappearing, along with all of the planets in our solar system, leaving only those who were on board interstellar traveling ships to find out what the hell happened. Only to stumble upon a single planet that is essentially a giant ocean of blood. Any questions popping into your head right now likely never get answered in the time you play this game. But your goal in the game is to try and find some answers for the good of humanity. Your mission is not only immensely important, it is direly hopeless. You are a criminal, sent to plunge deep into the ocean of blood and take pictures of points of interest and anomalies on an alien world that will hopefully aid the research on the planet. But you yourself were never meant to return home. And in the game, you feel that. And even if you had returned home, what would be the point? They would just send you out again and again until one day you didn't. Despite everything, with the story of Iron Lung screaming that you have no power, you still have agency and can investigate the points of interest in whatever order you see fit. Yes, you will inevitably meet your grisly end by the creature that stalks you for the entire game. So the story may end with you dying, but how you complete the objectives to get there, the order in which you do it is on you, the player. One final thing I just want to focus on and restate a bit, I never felt safe or powerful in Iron Lung. I just had agency. Now, giving the player a little bit of power isn't a bad thing in a Lovecraftian experience, but you have to be careful. Iron Lung is an experience that gives you the player zero power, but it gives you agency with your exploration and investigation to immerse you further into the experience. The next game we will discuss does safety and power perfectly, if you are looking for a longer experience than an hour and 20 minutes. Dredge. A fishing game? Yes, a fishing game. 
A fishing game gave me a more Lovecraftian experience than Call of Cthulhu. Dredge is such a masterpiece that I was determined to also 100% it. Dredge is a very calming game for about 70% of the time. When you aren't pursuing the main story and you're just fishing, you can just go fish forever and have a swell time listening to the beautiful music. However, when you choose to pursue the main story, you are confronted with a Lovecraftian tale of lost love, an island-bound populace that fears the sea, and a mysterious stranger who claims they can help you if you help them with things they refuse to tell you about. Everything in this world screams Lovecraft. If you pursue this story in a certain way, this happens. What? What the fu- It's amazing. So when I mentioned that this game strikes the perfect balance between agency and power, I meant it. You can pursue the story right away if you want, and you can do some pretty impressive things, but at no point are you personally killing any of the monstrous fish that you encounter during it. In fact, you are on the run from giant sea creatures a lot in this game, as well as the horrors that come out at night in the vast, corrupted sea of the world of Dredge. The only monster that you actually kill, you don't kill. You aid an absolute chad of an airman with killing it. Can you feel my but your role in this plan is setting traps and catching the proper bait to pull off a pretty genius plan that an airman concocted after losing his entire squad as well as any means to really escape the island apart from you. But his sanity is so far gone by this point that he just lives on the island. I mentioned a tragic love story earlier. Nothing says a tragic Lovecraftian love story quite like a choice between saving the world, but everything you have worked for is moot, essentially, or to bring back the love of your life at the cost of dooming the world. In good Lovecraftian stories, every accomplishment has a cost. But on the other hand, you know, you can just fish, avoid the main story, and try to drown the wants and needs of the main character with the endlessly wonderful bliss that comes from the peace of mind of fishing when suddenly... <laughs> What the f is that? That, my friend, is the story you are steering clear of in your ignorance. Or in my case, my furious need to complete the Pokedex. <laughs> then you finish your haul for the day and you make your way home, but you realize you stayed a little bit longer than you should have. It gets dark and all of a sudden you are being signaled by a ghostly vessel. And when you do follow, it chases you. It tries to kill you. It was actually a sea monster trying to bait you out with an illusion. You escape, return home, go to bed, wake up, and then what do you do? What matters is that you, the player, have the agency to live in bliss and ignore the world interacting with you. Or you have the agency to do something about it and to do it at your own pace. Or, you know, you try to sail away from the cursed waters and <laughs> you're dead. Whatever ending of the game you get, whether you get eaten by a giant sea monster, you doom the world to a horrific fate, or you lose the very reason why you started this journey in the first place, there is no absolute win. There is only not losing as much. But in some stories, Accepting loss means you win. While the gameplay is very basic, it is deeply rewarding and is only enhanced by the story. Basically, here's how it goes. You drive a boat and fish during the day, but try to return to a port before dark because when it gets dark out, life on the water becomes terrifying. The amount of fear this game puts into your soul about the fear of staying out late is palpable. As the game progresses, there are times when you have to catch a specific fish that only comes out at night. It is the perfect execution of establishing terror and then forcing you, the player, towards it. The game interacts with you, but it also gives you the power to interact with it or to not interact with it. With the neat superpowers you get from the mysterious stranger, you get huge benefits, but you also welcome the risk of building up fear quickly, which allows more scary things to interact with you during the night, and that is never good. 
but having the choice to welcome the risk into my gameplay is the kind of shit that rocks my world and feels so liberating as a player. While we're on the subject, superpowers. Yes, you get powers for your boat that help you get around faster and catch fish better and ward off the horrors of the sea. But at no point are you killing anything. You are still powerless against giant monsters and therefore have the perfect amount of power to feel capable but also terrified of running into conflict. That fear of conflict is awesome to sit in as a player and made this little game about fishing and dredging through the ocean's depths for long lost treasures enchanting and engaging from start to finish. That's what a good Lovecraftian game needs, a mystery interesting enough to force the player to combat their fear of conflict and loss caused by pursuing the mystery and those who may or may not want to stop them. Also, giving the player the means to choose how they pursue the mystery and when will give them the agency they need to suck them even further into the game because they feel like the game is at their disposal. The player will not want to put it down until the bitter end. It is a shame that the Call of Cthulhu branded games didn't quite hit the mark with what they were trying to accomplish. Both of them have some really awesome ideas that were either not fully realized or were unfortunately poorly executed. And with the gameplay, they either gave you too much power or they took away all your agency and basically should have just made a movie. There are more examples of great games that capture Lovecraftian horror and I hope to discuss them with you in the future. I wanted to focus on the usual Lovecraftian style of story, where the protagonist isn't some hero but just a normal person thrust into an extraordinary situation. So unfortunately, I couldn't chat about Darkest Dungeon today, though it is one of my favorite games. But anyways, I'm rambling. Hello! Thank you so much for watching the video. It means a lot. Did it make you think at all? I hope so. What are your thoughts on the difficulties of making a Lovecraftian experience? What are your thoughts on the games that I talked about today? Have you played any of them? Did you like any of them? Are you a fan of horror games at all? If so, share some of your favorites in the comments. Man, this video took me a long time. I had to rewrite it so many times. But I think it turned out all right. So the move I mentioned earlier in the video, it's done. We've moved, as you can see, but my dude, your boy has been busy. The Dead Space video also continues to blow my mind, having hit 12,000 views recently. That's crazy. Also, hey, Baldur's Gate 3, it uh, destroyed my potential of a social life, and it uh, didn't do my productivity any favors either, but hey, we beat it, and what an amazing game. <laughs> if it doesn't win Game of the Year, I'm gonna write a strongly worded letter to somebody and they're gonna be very confused why they received it. Once again, thank you so much for watching the video, especially if you've made it here to the end. I appreciate you being here so much. Anyways, stay safe out there and I will see you in the next video. Hopefully it doesn't take me as long. Have a good day. <laughs>